that Barker was going to be talking about uh, and informing us about watchmaking. And uh, Jeff has uh, got a tremendous amount of expertise in this area. Just to give you a little background, he's an expert in cybersecurity. He's got a PhD in computer science and a master's in information security management and engineering. He has lectured internationally and nationally, published a variety of different papers on that subject. Uh, he's an avid watch and clock collector. He has uh, he's a skilled watchmaker in his own right. And uh, he's a, he was honored as an NAWCC fellow in 2014. And uh, he's also an expert in valuing watches. And there's a lot of fakes out there and he knows, believe me, he can tell a fake from a mile away. He's been an officer of several chapters, both in Texas, Atlanta and Tennessee, where he now lives. And I believe he was elected to the board of the NAWCC uh, this year. Not, not quite yet. Not quite yet, but 23. In 23. Yeah. He will be on the board in 23, which is a great honor. It's my honor to introduce Jeff Barker. Thank you. How's everybody doing this afternoon? Good. Have you been enjoying the show? I, I know I have been. It's so good to see everybody. I actually went down to Texas last week for the uh, to Houston for the All Texas Chapters Regional. Uh, since I'm still a life member of Chapter 139, I hadn't seen all those folks for uh, almost three years, and I really missed everybody. It's so good to see everybody. So it was a, a very, very good show, but it's been a busy week. I only had two days to fit in for work, darn it. You know? <laughs> Today, and a slight correction, I got the fellow to the NAWCC this year. I've been a member since 2014. Um, so today we're going to talk about building your own wristwatch. Now, last week I ran this program. They asked me to present since I was taking the trouble to fly down and visit with everybody. They said, oh, can you do a presentation? I'm like, guys, I'm flying in. I'm not bringing anything with me. It's like, and they said, well, maybe just a few watches. I'm like, ah, oh, okay. You know, so... I tried this presentation out and it was a really big hit, but I actually had the watches with me during the presentation I was handing them out. This week, they are actually in the exhibit and I'm going to the exhibit and I'll be there for the walkthrough at 3.30. So if you wanna see them and possibly even handle them, we'll see what we're doing. That will be in the exhibit if you haven't seen them yet. Uh, those are the watches I was using and am using for the presentation. You'll actually see close-up photos of them, including one that no one has seen before yet. Ooh, I'm still on the workbench being finished up in today's session. So without further ado, oh, right, next spot. <laughs> I'm like, I'm used to my clicker. <laughs> All right, so the basic steps to follow when you're going to decide, I want to make a wristwatch, and I encourage anybody with even a moderate level of skill, try it. You can do it. If you can repair watches, you can certainly build one. If you're a novice, it's gonna take a little bit more practice, a little bit more experience. However, you may be able to get away with it using a kit. And I'll talk to you about what kits you can get that might be a good idea for you. But you're gonna to have to make a decision. What kind of watch is it gonna be? It could be a manual wind watch where you wind it by hand, by the crown. It could be an automatic, a self-winding watch which many watches are these days if they're not quartz, although there's lots of different subtypes, or it could be a quartz watch. Yes, you could actually build a quartz watch. No reason why not, just like you can build a mechanical watch. So it depends on what you want, but you have to decide what you want before you can go ahead and start building. It's kind of like plan ahead. It wasn't raining when Noah built the earth. Okay. <laughs> so you really want to plan ahead for this kind of thing. You also need to know not just what kind of engine it's going to have, what kind of movement, but what kind of style are you looking for? On the screen there, you can see uh, one of the first mechanical watches I built. Uh, and actually, that one uh, is a straight skeleton. I was trying to do, I saw one, uh, and I didn't think they did a very good job on it. And I decided I bet I could do a better job on this. So I decided to build it myself. Little did I realize that it was going to take several hundred hours and a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. Literally, those, some of those pivots are very, very sharp. Right? Mm -hmm. But at any rate, so that's an early skeleton I built. It's been modified several times, and uh, it is actually in the display. You'll be able to see that up close. 
Um, are you going to do a dress watch? You can build a dress watch just like you build any other kind of watch. For example, a pilot watch, a diver watch, or some general kind of sport watch. So the most important thing is decide what you want. Decide first, then plan. Next slide. Let's take a deeper dive into how much, how deep down the rabbit hole you can actually go. You could actually build your own movement. You need to be a master watchmaker, skilled, experienced, with lots and lots of time on the lathe if you're going to build it from the plates up. I don't recommend that for the faint of heart or the non-professional master watchmaker. If you've been through a class that took you somewhere around five years and much more blood, sweat, and tears with some oil mixed in, you could do this. I don't recommend it unless you're very serious about it and you're doing it more or less for a living or a passion. Uh, you could make your own case. There's no reason why you can't. There's materials available. Uh, they lay that pretty simply. There are some complications, but if you want to get, again, that far down the rabbit hole, you could do it. You can build a chronograph if you want. There's no reason why not. You just need the right movement, the right style cases, and the right accoutrement for it. Uh, you can re-engineer or modify a movement. Now, largely, that's what I do, uh, because mostly I'm still work full-time for a living, and I don't have time to build a movement from the from the plates up. I'm not even positive I could build what I wanted to without taking a few years and a lot of frustration break. So for what I do, I will find movements that are close enough to what I want, and then I actually modify them. And whether I modify them with uh, decorating plates or Geneva stripes or damascening or uh, different engravements or actually changing the function of the movements, for example, the one I'm doing right now is based on a 28242 series, but they have what I call a design flaw, where if you press the crown release in too far, it pops out of the, the lug pops out of the, the uh, shaft, and it, you've got to take it apart and fix it. And it's not a very big take it apart and fix it, but I don't like that. So I decided to modify it so it wouldn't be able to do it. And I changed it to an Elabora hairspring for more accuracy. So things like that, you don't have to, but it depends on what you're after and what you want to accomplish. On the one that I'm building now, where I did some of those engineering changes, I did that partly because I didn't want to spend $10,000 or so on an Omega Planet Ocean. So I figured, well, I'll build one that looks like one that's a little smaller because they're really big watches. Uh, and I won't spend the $10,000 on it. Instead, I'll spend time and a bit less. So that's why I decided to do some of those changes. Okay, you can also order custom dials with logos. If you want to say uh, Newman's Watch Company, for example, you could do that, um, or whatever your name is, Fred's Watches, or whoever, or you know, whatever you want to put on there. You could do that with crowns. You can do that with rotors, the weighted rotors on automatic movements. Um, you can do that with pretty much anything. You can get them from very cheap from Asia, read as China, um, or other Asian countries, or at least Pacific uh, countries. Or you can do them from America or France or Europe, uh, other places in Europe. Um, depends on what you want to accomplish, how many you're buying, and what you want to spend. Spend is a very big factor. Kind of think of it this way. If you go way to the east, you're not going to spend a lot. The further west you come, the more you're going to spend okay, on getting these things done. So you've got several choices and options when you decide, I'm going to build a wristwatch. How much you want to create how much work you really want to do on it, how much time and how much do you want to invest in it. Okay, remember your time's worth something too. Even if you're not getting your honeydews done, it's still valuable to some of them, okay? How much money you want to spend on it, big factor, okay? And how much time, again, I underline that. Do you want to spend putting this together? Because remember, at the end of the day, I mean, hello, we're at the watch show, right? You can get a watch. <laughs> so, <laughs> This is only for people that have that creative drive, that passion, that spirit, or just that curiosity because it's there. I want to see if I can do it. That's what got me started. Okay, next slide. Now, you are going to need some tools. And in the last workshop, I actually moved this slide up because the first thing everybody wanted to know or wanted to point out to me is, what tools do I need? And I'm like, really? That was your first question? It was. So I said, okay, let's talk about tools first. Right up front. What do you need? Here's your shopping list. You have got to have a loop, loops, or a microscope. I use loops and a microscope. Okay, microscopes are a lot better because they free up both hands and they give you a better field of view to do what you need to do. 
Again, it depends on how deep down the rabbit hole you're going for a general purpose or a kit that you buy, loops are fine. You need a good set of jeweler's screwdrivers. That means not eBay, right? They should be French, Swiss, English. Those are all good. German are all good. American are good. Again, stay away from the Far East. Okay, watch out for India and China. They're not going to work for you. They don't last. The quality is generally not there. I am not making any national statements or judgments. I am speaking solely from experience. Okay? Now, you need some tweezers, and I mean the kinds that you see there. These are two of my favorite Dumont. Uh, they're French tweezers. They're number two, number five. Good set of screwdrivers. That's here, uh, Orotech. Um, and actually, you can see some of the parts of the movement that I'm working on now. There's the 2824. There's the case with the ceramic. Uh, and that's some parts I'm not sure what. Oh, that could be the doll. Uh, these are really good German end cutters. You need something that will cut hardened steel. Why? Because you're going to be doing it, especially when you cut the stem. If you try to use a little pair of side cutters, first of all, you will not have the right measurement. There's a little gap because they, they're kind of angled and then the cutting edge is recessed inside that typically. So you want something that is not recessed, that is precise, and is probably a little bit more than you need. That way you can keep using those end cutters, those nippers, after your first crown. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? Again, you're hearing me talk about quality. Uh, calipers you're going to need uh, because you've got to be able to measure. Remember, measure twice, cut once. One of my favorite expressions from early on was, I cut that stem three times, it's still too short. <laughs> and that's not fun. In a lot of cases, when you're starting out, order duplicates, get extras, okay? Because you may need them. <laughs> you're going to need a pin vise. A pin vise holds your stem when you're going to cut it to the right length. Because remember, stems come in generic manufactured lengths. But depending on the size of your movement, the distance from the case edges, and the diameter of the case itself, plus the kind of crown you're using, is it waterproof, non-waterproof? You're gonna have to cut that stem to length. So be prepared for that. And we'll cover that in a little bit more detail. Of course, you'll need files. Um, you're gonna need hand presses when it comes time to put the dial onto the movement and get the hands onto the watch itself, the cannon pinion, the hour, the minute, and the second. Wherever the positions are, you have to have hand pressers to fit them. Now, depending on how you work, for example, I work on pocket watches. So I've got a platform type presser that's got three sizes and I set them up for typical pocket watch size, hour, minute, and second. Um, but they will also work for wristwatch size. You can also do a single platform type. And what I mean by platform, I'll show you a picture of one in just a minute, is you put the movement on the bottom below the hands, they're spring loaded, uh, the pressers rather, and they come down and press the hand on. It's a lot more precise than doing that by hand with a hand presser. Although there are times, which I'll talk about, when a hand presser does come in handy, a single stick type instead of just a platform. Okay, uh, you need a good movement holder. You're gonna need a rubber ball. Anybody know what the rubber ball is for? Anybody have a guess? The back off. Yeah, take the back off. Because once you get that back off, they usually don't come very tight when you're buying just a case where you need a JAXA opener or a special wrench. Uh, for the waterproof types or snap off. Um, so it's really handy to have a good rubber ball. Like I've seen a bunch of them in the market. They're usually very inexpensive and you can reinflate them when they inevitably get to be kind of scrunched up and lose all their air. Um, but it's good to have that because you can just screw the, the back off and then hand screw it on just so it stays without rattling. Um, it'll come on and off several times, trust me. Um, you may need some super glue. Anybody know what the super glue is for? Crystal. Maybe, but not necessarily. Anybody else? Yes? Audience participation? Holding the part to be worked. Holding the part to be worked, maybe. But in this case, when you finally fit the crown to the stem mm -hmm. and you tighten it, it's a good idea to put just a little dab of super glue in there because when the watchmaker behind you comes along to take it off, it won't bind it too hard, but it's not going to come loose. So it's a nice little handy tip that I use. Just a little teeny dab. And it's just enough extra grab so that when somebody goes to wind it in the wrong direction or sets press to set the time or the date or whatever, the crown is not going anywhere. It'll give it just enough adhesion so it won't come up. And of course, finger cots, everybody knows what those are, right? Finger cots, the little rubber finger thingies we put on. I'm not going to use the C word, right? Um, 
And those will protect your fingerprints, oils, and acids from getting on the dial, the hands, the movement, et cetera. So we want to have a good set of fingerprints. Hint, if you got large fingers, buy large cuts, okay? If your fingers start tingling with these things on, it means they're too tight, okay? So get the right size, particularly if you're going to be wearing them for a while. Trust me on this. This is experience. Can you use gloves? Yes, you could use gloves if you want. Um, I'm not big on gloves because I feel like I lose too much feel and, and you know precision from them. I prefer the finger cuts. But yeah, you can use gloves. Yep, absolutely. Good questions. Okay, and if you got more as I'm going along, just jump right in there and ask. Bob, next slide. Okay, here's the hand pressers I was talking about in several different flavors. This is the freeway one. Uh, there's the finger cuts. Uh, this is a single platform one. Um, depends on what you're working for. And these are Virgion stick type, where you literally have different sizes for the different hands you're working on. You get the movement in a movement holder, and then you literally press down the hands onto the, onto the pinions. Anybody know what this bad boy is? You probably do, I bet. What's that? Hand remover. Hand remover, yes. That is my favorite old-fashioned type of hand remover, where it applies negative pressure instead of the little grippers that you often find that go under the hands and you get a kind of push down and lift up. These kind of, when you push down, it lifts the hand up for you, which is kind of nice. So I like that type. It's a little bit more old fashioned, but I like that better. Up in the left corner there is, that's the, the homage to that uh, Planet Ocean Omega that I'm building. And that is the movement assembled with the hour hand on it. I was testing run and fit on that. So that's the, uh, that's the one that I was hoping to bring here, but it's not done yet because I found one more thing I wanted to change. Next one. Okay, I talked about buying a kit. Now, this is a great thing for people who are not as experienced, but want to put together a watch anyways, just because for the creative desire or the satisfaction of wearing something you made, all of these are valid reasons. And this comes from a company called Esslinger. I do business with Esslinger. It's called the Classic uh, watch kit, uh, or you can see the URL right there, the web address is esslinger.com slash make my own watch kit. Um, and that is the box that it comes in. Actually, the inside box is a pretty nice gift box um, that everything comes packed inside. Here, you'll see the actual components of what you get in the kit, and it lays out what you need to do and how you need to do it. Now, for about $200, this is a very decent kit. It's an NH35 movement, that's uh, Seiko or uh, TMI. And it comes with a white and a black dial. It comes with a set of hands, comes with a band and pins, crown, I'm sorry, set of stems rather, a uh, crown and a fairly nice case. It's got an exhibition case back, meaning the back is glass as well. You can see the computer. Now, when I got this, it didn't quite have what I wanted. So I changed a few things. Um, on the watch you'll see in the display, you'll notice it's a blue pattern dial because I didn't like either white or black. I wanted blue. So I bought the blue dial. I didn't like the hands, so I bought a new set of hands. I didn't like the strap, so I bought a different strap. And last but not least, I wanted to add just a little, how should I say a touch of pumps. So I added a Cyclops do it, a little magnifier over the calendar, okay, over the date. Why? Because anybody seeing that Cyclops, the first thing they go is, Rolex. is that a Rolex? Mm -hmm. And no, it's not. It's a $200 kit that I put together. <laughs> but it gets a little bit of attention to your rescue. So it's like, you know, why not? Yes, sir. Porch mover? No, this is an automatic movement. It's a, I'm sorry, it's an NH35. So there you can see it right there. Uh, if you saw the back of it, you'd see it. Uh, next slide, Bob. So if you're going to customize it, that's the end result. Looks a little bit different from what that kit looked like, didn't it? I like that. That's my taste. Sherry might like it in black or white. I don't know. So, you know, it could be high contrast. Whatever. Okay, so the kit cost about $199. That's the going rate for it. The dial was an additional $40. I paid too much for that dial. Some dials are a lot cheaper than that. However, it was made for the kit. I figured, ah, oh, what the heck, like, you know. A little bit more support for Esslinger. One of the things I like about Esslinger, by the way, is they have a lot of educational videos. They really try to educate the people that want to learn more and work on watches. And I was, I'm was i very impressed by that. They've always been a good company to deal with. They're up in Minnesota, uh, fine people. And so 
it's kind of like Disney. Um, the cost is a little bit high, but you do get what you pay for. Um, and they've got great support. So the dial is 40 bucks too much. The Cyclops magnifier, a few bucks. You need to glue the magnifier on to the crystal. That's how it works. Okay, and if you ever wanted to know how to remove those, it works the same way you put it on. Shine an ultraviolet light on it, the glue will loosen up and pull it off. Uh, that's about it. <laughs> and the same way when it goes on, you buy a little vial of ultraviolet glue, uh, it'll last you probably half a lifetime, if not more. And uh, you just position the crystal, the little cyclops over the date window. Remember, put the, do be careful with your positioning because you don't want to unglue and re-glue this three times, right? Uh, and then just glue it on and it, and it comes out very nicely. It's good and it's very handy if you if you want the uh, extra bump in making the date bigger. Uh, the hands were about eight dollars. The strap was another twenty dollars. Those are the prices that I paid. I don't think I got the strap from Esslinger, but again, for what? Under two hundred and you know fifty, sixty dollars, you can build your own wristwatch. And if you've never done this before and you don't have a lot of experience, this is a great place to start. Boogering things up is a technical term. And it's very easy when you're starting out to booger things up. That means break them or mess them up beyond repair. Okay, we could use other acronyms, but it's a general G-rated audience. So we'll just say you can really mess them up. So that's the time when you want to get maybe a couple of extras. Notice they included two stems with a kit. Gee, I wonder why, right? You might want a couple of extra sets of hands just in case. Okay, things like that. And if God forbid you destroy the movement somehow, right? I think they're under $20 if you buy them alone, or 25 for that one, something like that. But they're very, very reasonable. And that's why I say start slow, start easy, and don't require a second mortgage when you're starting out. Okay, because the more high end you get, the more expensive it is to fix mistakes. Next slide. Okay, there's other places to purchase components. For example, hello, national or regional shows or meets, right? Other meets we have. Your chapter may have tech sessions or swap meets or anything like that, or may have people in it that know how to source parts. Ask them, tell people, hey, I'm trying to build a wristwatch. Can anybody tell me where to get good parts? You'd be amazed the answers you get. Use your resources. eBay is still a good source. Keep in mind, you must determine the origin when you go to buy these things. Remember, if it's $1.380 and it's shipped from China, you are going to get what you pay for. I don't advise that. Yes, it's not as big an investment, but again, you've got to watch quality. And the problem that I find more often than not is when they say 21 millimeters, it's, it's 20 and a half or 21 and a half. Okay, if it says it's perfectly silk screened, it's not. Letters fall off, right? Yeah, you don't want that kind of thing. It's just not worth the frustration. So again, be careful what you're buying and where it's sourcing. Etsy these days, believe it or not, has become a fairly decent resource for good things. Everything from custom straps to cases to watch parts, they're, they're showing up there. Um, and those are some of the ones that I would trust more, as well as your regular favorite watch suppliers. Uh, if you go out and start looking for just type in ETA watch movement, you're gonna find at least a half a dozen suppliers just by typing in that. If they have movements, they've got everything else or a lot of everything else so they'll know where to get it. Okay, and that will give you a good idea as to market prices and what you're gonna pay. Some of them are still a little cheeky unless you sign up an account, they won't tell you the price. I usually don't bother with them, at least up front, unless I know, you know, I know who they are, it's worth it to. Remember that when you're searching, the first five to 10 things you're going to see have two little letters in front of the URL, the address, add. Skip right on by those. People are making money for those and they're paying for your click. Okay, so go past the ads to where the real searches begin. Okay, does everybody get that? It's a word to the wise for anything you're searching. Okay, uh, you can go to manufacturers. That works too sometimes. Like you can actually go to... Well, it's hard to go to Swatch Group and say, sell me an ETA movement. They'll just hang up on your laptop phone or whatever and say, no, they cannot do this. Sorry. Mm -hmm. They have an answer. Okay, but there's other places where you can go to the manufacturer, like watch straps, for example. If you want to get a Barton watch strap, go to Barton. If you want to get a Hirsch, go to Hirsch, et cetera, et cetera. I know it doesn't seem like they have the best prices, but uh, this 
Spartan racing strap I got for the watch because I liked it. Uh, and it's the right color, navy blue. Um, they had the cheapest price, the manufacturer, for anybody I could find. And it was it was incredibly reasonable. I think it was like $20. And anybody who's used Barton before, they are really good quality. They're durable, they're well made. Um, they're good. So it was well worth it. Now, here's some of the other parts from the back of the watch that I'm building. That is that uh, ETA 282042 movement, uh, the Elbore. Uh, those are some of the uh, clamps to hold the movement in. That's the back of the case. Uh, hands over there. I, I made got custom hands for that. And that's probably the back of the dial. And so I'm missing something. Next. Okay. This is a, my most recent skeleton creation. It was really interesting putting this together. Of all the skeleton watches I have built, this one has hands down got the most attention. I have not yet walked into a room and, you know, we're not going to a lot of places these days, right? <laughs> where in that watch where people haven't said, oh, 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 that's beautiful. Where did you get that? Unless you want them to ask you questions that could be embarrassing, like how long, how much, when could you make me one? Right? <laughs> Don't say I made it. <laughs> or be reluctant about that. Has anyone ever, listen, has anyone ever told anyone they make ice cream? Anyone had that experience? Okay, I lived in Alaska for 10 years. And I don't know why. I think it was because we had salmon berries growing out back and I decided on a lark to try it. I made salmon berry ice cream. And then I made the fatal mistake. I told my friend about it. And guess what she did? She told all her friends about it. <laughs> And guess what started happening? My phone started ringing off the hook. Jeff, can you make us some ice cream too? We want some ice cream. And I'm like, oh God, what have I done? Right? <laughs> Just be aware that this may happen. Okay. <laughs> so um, these are the components, like I said, that you're going to need for a basic watch build. Now, with a skeleton movement, you have a dial optional. And this is the first time I decided to put a skeleton dial on a skeleton movement. Because the problem with putting a solid sandwich type or any other type of dial on a skeleton movement is guess what? Can't see that the bottom of the dial. Is. Bottom is where the hands are, right? We call it the top because we're looking at it, but it's actually the bottom, right? Okay, so I decided to get a skeletal one. And the other problem I had with skeleton watches is I can put luminous hands on them, but they didn't have any dial markers. And I have yet to figure out how to relatively easily engrave them into the crystal, front or back, and you know, color them or loom them or something. So I haven't tried that yet. So I got a skeleton dial that actually had luminous markers on them. And uh, that was really interesting because now I can see it in the dark. There was just one problem when I first spec this build, I wanted Breguet style hands. So I bought a set of blue steel Breguet style hands. Guess what happens when you put dark blue steel hands on a black background? They disappear because Polly can't see the hands. I was like, okay, next. <laughs> so threw those out and bought some sword style uh, luminous, really nicely loomed, vintage loom uh, hands, and those worked out just right. Okay, so what are we looking at here? We are looking at the front of the case. It's got plastic over the Crystal, the uh, big pilot style crown, that's the stem before it's cut. There's actually a uh, temporary stem that in this case is uh, screwed on there pretty good. We just cut that off. The back, notice it's a waterproof type case uh, with a mineral crystal back. There's our movement, which I did modify. That's after it's been modified. That's the movement holder ring. You have the option to use a movement holder ring or movement lugs or both. And then of course the dot. The reason the hands aren't in there is I'd already set aside the brigade back in stock and I hadn't gotten the new hands yet when I took that picture. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah, everybody's following me. Any questions so far? Are we in good shape for the shape we're in? <laughs> cool. Next. Okay, that's the completed watch. And that's the one that's sitting in the case out of the exhibition, which we'll go take a walk through at about 3.30 to look at. You can see it front and back. It's pretty dramatic. It looks pretty good, I gotta say. I enjoy wearing it. I enjoy watching it, um, looking at it. So um, again, I talked about the Breguet hands. That wouldn't work on that dial at all. I discovered that after I put them on. I couldn't see them. 
Um, so we changed the sword hands, everything's luminous, so you can see it in the dark. Um, and that's a big advancement over the plain old skeleton. Plus, you can still see the skeleton is the important part. Especially, Especially when you change, you know, screws, the blue screws, and you do some rose work or engraving work, or you just, you know, change the, you know, little aspects of the, the movement itself to get a little bit more precision out of it. You really want to be able to see it. Especially when you work full time. And people get you, what shall I say, distraught. Rather, you have to resist the urge somehow to, you know? So rather than lose off, I'll just sit and look at my wall. And it calms me. And it preserves my meaningful life of being able to be gainfully employed because I haven't throttled somebody that needs it. Right? Okay. On the Next. previous slide, did you buy those as a kit? No, 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 no. Thanks for going back, Bob. No, everything there is spec individual. I decided what I wanted to build up so that I wanted to try a nice gold tone case. I hadn't used a gold tone case with a gold movement before. I mean, go figure. But I like the silver with the gold before. So I decided to do yellow. So I got a PVD gold plated case. Um, I had a certain size and spec for that. I actually wanted a bigger crown because they're easier to wind, they're easier to grip and wind. Um, I wanted one that had the option for a movement ring as well as the lugs or, or instead of the lugs. And I wanted one that I could readily put a dial on that would still show off everything. So everything got specced individually here. I don't. I, I did that kit once essentially to try it out and I liked the results, but unless I were building it for somebody, I, I do all my own now at this point in spec. So good question. Any others? Okay, flipping in, good. Okay. Exhibition case backs are really, really showy. I mean, to me, don't build a watch like this unless you're going to show it off. You know, there are exceptions. You get the real ooh ah factor on this because let me tell you something. When somebody sees the front of it, they go, wow. But when they you show them the back of it, they go, ooh ah. <laughs> Right? I mean, it's pretty dramatic and it's wonderful because you can see the escapement going, the escape wheel, you can see, you know, the balance wheel going, you can see everything. Okay, if you wind it, you can see the main spring wind. Out. I mean, it's like, it's really, really putting things back. So I say show that off if you can. Okay, quartz watches. I'm like, what's the point of that? I've got a quartz watch actually, it's in my display at my table. And this is a German made watch by uh, Bund and Unson Glashut. Okay, so it's a good manufacturer in Germany. They used a beautiful uh, Ronda Swiss quartz movement, which they put uh, Geneva stripes in a quartz movement. I don't know why, but they did it. And they put an exhibition back on this. And I'm like, so you can see the battery? <laughs> Mm -hmm. I don't know. They yeah. designed it that way, but it's like, who wants to see the back of a quartz watch? So, yeah. I mean, maybe if you make it, you're really proud of it. Okay. But it's like, otherwise, I'm, I'm at a little bit of a loss. They are not as waterproof. So, if you're building a diver, no matter how sexy that movement is, it's not your best bet to put a two piece glass and metal case on it. You really want something that will seal up well because your absolute priority is keeping the water out of that watch. Makes sense? So, I mean, you can build a beautiful watch, you can have a beautiful automatic movement, you can decorate the life out of it. I don't know why you would if it's in a sealed case, but you want to keep the water out. That's the priority. Okay, so maybe not so much. Next one. All right, I mentioned that I'm building the Omega Planet Ocean homage, uh, and I've shown you some of the parts of it, and it's coming along pretty well. Why? Because it's a 42 millimeter waterproof case that I spec, And I had a case made in Germany for it to the general style of Omega close enough. Um, I don't want to infringe any copyrights. And I put a blue ceramic uh, loom dial bezel in there with 120 clicks. So it's, it shows up well and it's in the right style. Uh, it's a sapphire crystal. I did put an exhibition back on it, even though the real Planet Ocean is a very deep rated diver, 300 meters or more. Um, for the different models. This thing, I'm like, yeah, I don't think I'm just going to swim that deep anymore. I'm getting a little old for that. So I said, that's fine. I want to be able to show off this movement. It's it's a really pretty movement, the, the 28-24. Um, and so I did put the exhibition back on it. 
Uh, the yellow bore, it refers to the hairspring. I took out the hairspring that was in it and put in a higher grade hairspring, essentially. It means it's more precise, it's more fine, and the regulation of it is far better. So I can actually get this movement down to about what we'll call cost standard with about two to three seconds a day fast or slow, which most 28, 24 twos, you can probably get to about 10 if you're really good at it, if they're new and in good shape, but I wanted it a little bit tighter. So pride, just purely pride. Um, I did add the broad arrow style hands with vintage loom on it. I did a blue Omega style dial as close as I could get. And of course I added the blue uh, Barton strap because I like leather better than I like stainless for it. And I can always add a stainless you know, belt to it or a strap to it. So that's the one I'm building right now, go ahead, Bob. These again are the parts for it. Uh, I don't know if I have another photo of it put together. It is assembled, but I was telling somebody, I think it might have been Rich, that um, I was just about done with it. I was actually planning to bring it to the show uh, this weekend. However, I realized that it still had what I call the factory defect for 2024s, which is if you depress the, the crown release pin too far. Um, the pin actually jumps out of the little indentation, the detente, that holds the crown in place. And then you've either got to take it apart from the front or take it apart from the back to fix that, which only takes a few minutes, but it takes a while to get everything out of the watch, the, the movement and get it all back together. And I said, I don't want to have this happen again. It's too frustrating. Just because I used the tip of a needle nose pliers instead of a small screwdriver to release it, it's like, that shouldn't happen. And you know, I've got vintage Rados that are that are 40 years old or more, and they use 28, 24 movements. And guess what? Problem is with them too. That's the first time I learned how to take one apart because I had to, right? But on this one, I had just put the dial on. I just perfectly balanced the hands. Everything was level, parallel, you know, to the, you know, two millimeter that I wanted it to and everything. And I'm like, no. No, no, I'm not taking this thing apart again. You know, so I decided, okay, we're not going to have this happen again. So I'm going in from the back. So I don't have to redo all that. I got to take the uh, the mainspring out and the barrel out and, you know, get to the keyless, but you know, yeah, whatever. It's just a little bit more time in the bench, right? Okay. Um, go back that one oh, slide one more time. Oh. Thanks. Okay. So that's a pretty good rendition dial that I like. That's the movement. Uh, from what you would call the top, it's actually the bottom. There's the case, it looks black because it's sitting in plastic, but it's actually uh, dark navy blue. That's the hands again. And um, that's some of the other miscellaneous parts you can't even see through the glare. Um, but that's what it takes. Now, one other footnote on this. This is an interesting thing. When I ordered the 2824, there are different minute and hour, well, it's actually the H wheel, which is the hour wheel. There's H sizes one through five. If you don't know that, they refer to different heights in millimeters, and they sent this movement with an H3, and I needed an H1. And guess when I found that out? I found that out after I put the hour hand on, and it went just fine. That's what it sits on, that wheel. But when I went to put the minute hand on, not so much. Okay, what do we always learn about when we're working on watches or cars even for that matter? Don't force anything or use excessive pressure. And the first time I tried to seat that minute hand, it didn't seat. Normally they'll just go tink and they just click right into place at the right spot. You can feel it, you can hear it, it's very tactile. In this case, it didn't. It kind of got a little bit canted and it didn't want to seat. And I thought, oh, that, that something's weird there. And I thought, did I order the wrong size hand? Yeah, I measured it again. No, I ordered the right size hands. Everything was good. And I couldn't figure out what the heck it was. And I looked at it again and I realized the hour wheel was sticking up a little too far for the minute hand to actually see. That was the problem. In other words, I need enough shaft on the minute pinion so that it'll actually grab. You've got about meh, half a, a millimeter for it to really see. And this thing went up too far past that half millimeter. So it could literally couldn't grab that actual opinion. And that was the problem. That's why I wouldn't see it. However, when I stuck it under the microscope, guess what I had done? I boogered it up. Yep. Whoever said that quietly, yes, I boogered it up. I actually bent the, the flange, the, the like, you know, the, the cup that forms at the bottom of the hand where it sits on that pinion correctly and grabs it. Yep. I dented in one side and I, I, I kind of like 
distorted the other side. I was like, oh, I'm great. Right? Happens to the best of us. I shouldn't have pushed that hard quite, but I figured it's just going to seep, and it didn't. So, guess what I did? Anybody have a guess? Ordered one. Ordered another one. No, I had ordered two to begin with. And said, We're going to cut. You blew oh. super glue coming? No, no super glue. <laughs> <laughs> now we have a whole different set of tools for this one. Now, in this one, I said, I'm too stubborn. I only ordered one set anyways of hands because I didn't figure I was going to booger up the set of hands at this point. Um, so no, I got out my brooches and put it under the microscope. And I actually was able to get that 100% perfectly back to round again between some uh, a little bit of brooch work and filing and, and a little bit of work with a staking set. And I got the, the you know diameter correct and I got it perfectly in round. And I put it back in the hand presser and tink. It's seated perfectly. I'm like, don't, don't touch it. Don't breathe. Don't anybody move. <laughs> so, which is part of the reason why I don't want to go in again from the dial side to fix that the, the keyless works. But I want to fix it because I'm not going to do that again. So especially in this case. Also, another footnote. A big heavy movement like a 2824 comparatively, like an NH35 or another, let's say, uh, Japanese made or Asian made movement is not doesn't weigh that much. It's maybe an ounce or so. But the the Swiss movements have quite a bit of weight to them comparatively. Uh, and the rotors are pretty heavy too, and they've got a pretty pretty good amount of swing. So I don't like to rely just on a movement holder ring for those. I'm kind of like the pessimistic Englishman that will wear both suspenders and a belt. Okay, so I use movement clamps because if they're screwed down, it's not going anywhere. If you rely on a movement holder only, you can get some shit. And sooner or later, it will cause part wear or some kind of distortion uh, or you know some kind of alignment problem. So I'm fine with filling the space in the case around the movement with it. No reason not to, but if you want to, However, uh, for me, I really rely on the clamps, especially for heavier movements. Okay, so screw them down to your case is my suggestion on that. If you look here, see that gold ring inside? That big, heavy thing is the movement holder. That's a lot of weight in there. So that may be a factor too. You may not want that much weight in the case. Okay, that weighs almost half the weight of the whole case combined. So, all right, now, Next slide. Questions? <laughs> yes, sir. Earlier you said you like the microscope because you could use both hands. Why can't you use both hands with a movement? You can, but it's, you technically you can. When somebody wears glasses like me, usually it's fastened on and I can still use both hands, but I find like my field of view moves, I gotta move a little bit and stuff. And it's more about having the piece fixed, having the field of view fixed um, and being able to really work it without anything moving around into it. So I, it's not, I, I kind of think of it like that because I, I don't know why, but I still tend to, when I'm using a loop, I'll hold on to something too, even if it's in a movement holder or something, um, just to make sure it's steady. And with a microscope, I've got it pretty well planted um, in, in a fixed holder, it's not moving anywhere because I, I need you to have that field of view. So personal preference. Well, I've operated with loops and microscopes and I like loops because I can move them around. That's okay. why working on people and not watch. Okay, yeah. well, that different story. Yeah, <laughs> I don't, I don't work on people. But yeah, um, but yeah, it's just my personal preference. I like it better. Can you build an Accutron? Yes, you can, but you're going to need to find an Accutron movement. Are you talking about the vibrating fork type? Yes, you can, but you'd have to get one from Bola um, or find a Bola one that you can use. There's still plenty of them out there. Um, there's actually people that do a lot of good restoring that are in NEWCC. Um, Jared Harkness, he's down in Texas. He's really good and does a lot of uh, electrics and uh, Accutron work. I'd rely on something from him any day of the week. So, okay. That's a good question. Yeah, some of it's personal preference. There's people that might never want to use a microscope. Um, for me, I just like it better. It's partly because I just started getting used to doing things with a microscope, I think, and I, I just work a little bit better with it. In your first uh, kit, you said you had less than three hundred dollars in the yeah. watch as you customized it. How about in the skeleton watch? What's the re relatively difference in price for the, all the components that you? Probably up to a few thousand. 
Um, you can do it for less depending on what you want to use. But to me, I've learned my lesson, but don't do it for less. It's going to come back and bite you. So decide what you want. Decide the grade that you want in the spec. Decide a budget that you've got for it. Make sure your wife is aware of it if you're married or figure out how to call it a dishwasher. Um, and, you know, <laughs> both in there. <laughs> but I'm not, no, it's, uh, I mean, in my case, it's it's really a matter of, I knew I wasn't going to get out of the um, the one I'm building, that, that uh, Planet Ocean homage cheap. Um, but, you know, there's a big difference between spending 3000 and spending 10000 So sure. that's 7000 you go to something else. And a lot of people have to decide based on budget if they may not have it to spend. So, um, I, and it's also going to depend on how much you want to do and what you want to do. Like, for example, you could get a Japan-made skeletonized movement that's really good quality that's going to cost you maybe a few hundred as compared to a Unitas uh, 6497 type skeleton, which is probably going to cost you somewhere upwards of 2000 So. Um, you could get a Chinese one, which will cost you less than a hundred, but I wouldn't advise it. Um, your maximum life on that probable lifetime is three years um, under normal usage. Or it's plastic. plastic or not, it's the it's the their quality control, their precision, their attention to detail, their fitment, and their measurements are never so far up to par. The best company I've seen out of China is Seagull. Uh, they've been around the longest, um, and, you know, I've got a Seagull-based Turbion watch that I really wanted to see what they did and how they put it together and everything, and max lifetime on that thing is three years, as compared to a Podek Philippe, which is going to cost you 120 grand, but it will be around for at least three generations as compared to three years, as long as it's properly maintained. Uh, Jeff, would you re recommend on a starting watch or a beginning kit to use something like an NH35, which is a Seiko movement, good or Myota movement, something like that? Yeah, Seiko, Myota, you know, any of those are going to, yeah, uh, one of the, the one of the the Japan SII companies and TMI companies is good. Hattori Seiko is very, you know, any of their oils are all pretty much combined now, but um yeah and you could you could go with a higher end Seiko like a 423 is still available that's what they use in their uh press edge line um mm -hmm. and some of their higher end divers really good movements they're not too expensive right? yeah so if you don't like the NH35 series like and the NH35 series is near 35s 36 39 uh you could go up to a citizen uh, or Miota uh 90 series or 9015 or 28A I be, you know, really high quality movements. Uh, that's a good alternative to like a Vincetta. So. And, and they're considerably cheaper. Salida, Saida, if you pronounce it. Saida is also a little bit less expensive uh, than 2824. And so far, I'm seeing the performance and their quality darn close to Eta. Like almost you can't find them apart. A little bit different design, philosophy, and engineering. Quality is 100%. Anybody else? Yes, sir. This is a little off the subject of building a watch, but what exactly did you do to solve the <clears throat> detent problem on the 2824? Because I come in around. I'm too. sure you come along with that. I found a, a, that there is just enough gap tolerance so that if I build an, a little stud on the, it's the, the uh, clutch, the back of the clutch that releases where normally if you push the stud, it's gonna go up and just keep going and it releases. Well, if you build a little stud on that, that's about two millimeters high, it can't go past it, mm. but it'll release. So mm. that's the same like flaw that uh, don't, if, when you take one apart, did you have to have the stem already out? That if you don't do that yes. with a 20, 20 yes. when you go back to put it together, it won't go in. Yes, that is it. Will exactly. that cure that too? Yes, it does. That's okay. the same problem. It's just a different angle, yeah. And I call it a design flaw. I mean, you've had the same thing going on for 40 years. Just because everybody knows about it doesn't mean it's not correct. I mean, it's not incorrect. It is. Well, they so we could copy that and still let the design flaw. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't tried it on a Salida yet, but I mean, I mean, not that that's here for them, but yeah. I just like what you're talking about. There's something only a watchmaker could probably do, right? I would think so. Yeah, that's gonna. That's not for the starting out person. 
uh, Ira can play that for sure. Because yeah. mm -hmm. you could you could booger it up in repair easily. So the remedy to that is to go in through the backside. It's a lot easier for me to go into the back, especially if I don't feel like ripping the hands off the dial off the uh, hour. The the time. Let me see. You got to get rid of the date assembly, the date wheel. Basically, all the time and date works have to come off the top of it to get to the keyless, which is like stupid to me. It's like and every time you do that, you always risk marking the dial. And you risk marking the, the dial or fingerprints or anything that you don't want or scratching. Yeah, you know the date. Wheel, I mean, it's like, uh. -uh. So for me, it's easier to just take the power off and make sure the power's down, take the mainspring out. I mean, that's about it. That's all you need to do to get out of there. Just get the barrel out of it, and there is your keyless right there. That'd be so. true pretty much on most washer fields. Pretty much, yeah. No. Well, well, it's one alternative. I mean, everybody is taught to go into the front and completely disassemble it. That's the factory procedure. But I'm like, that's stupid. That's about as stupid as making the flaw there to begin with. Why don't you go in from the back? It's like so much less to take apart. So. For me, it's self-preservation because I've only got a limited amount of time. And, you know, we've all encountered frustration where, you know, if you get frustrated, the best thing to do is walk away until you're not frustrated anymore because you will break something. Um, if you ever walked over cars, you notice the future. Yeah. Um, so for me, you know, it's just, it's about time conservation and efficiency. But, yeah, good questions. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Controversial question. No. Are the movements in a uh, Rolex worth a tremendous premium that you pay for the <laughs> average Rolex? Well, I could answer that. A variety of different movements. I could answer that question by asking you: Is the price of a Rolex worth worth the price of admission these days? So it is somewhat subjective, in my opinion. Having worked on Rolexes and understanding what makes them go, what makes them special, and particularly what the fake people do to try to imitate them, Rolex is an extremely good company. They are very good in the R&D. They're very good in quality control. They're very good in engineering. They're tops. I mean, you can get as good. It's really hard to get better. To get better, you've got to have in-house handmade uh, movements that are done on a case-by-case -case basis. So... Is it worth the price? In this market, to me, no. And the reason for that is partly because I had the experience of when I got my latest degree, I just graduated in April, I decided to get myself a Rolex. I don't know why, figured, okay, what the heck? So I didn't want to order it before I graduated because I was afraid I'd change myself. So I had priced them ahead of time through the, the authorized distributor, of course, right, for a new one. And I wanted a Skydor. And the sky dweller I was looking at was stainless steel, blue dial, nothing fancy. You can tell I like blue, right? And uh, when I first went to price them out in 2020, they were about probably about $20,000 for the one I wanted. When I went to order one in April of 2022, just a few months ago, $32,000 and a two year waiting. I said, I will have forgotten everything I learned in this damn degree by the time I get to watch. <laughs> and I pay that for like cars, not for watches these days. It seemed a little bit excessive, which is why that's actually why I decided for my graduation watch, I actually got a ball fireman victory that really wanted one for a while. And I darn well couldn't find one. They stopped making them a few years ago when that's what I wanted. But I actually did find a brand new one. I don't know why. But I decided to forego that, and that's actually part of the inception for this Omega Planet Ocean. I was a little frustrated with the, the Rolex. So, in my opinion, the market, like the used car market right now, is overinflated by at least 30%. Yeah. Um, I think it will correct like the real estate market will, and maybe one of these days the car market. Who knows? Um, when? I don't know. Uh, Rolex, above all else, is phenomenal at marketing, and they control their market, they control their uh, entire vertical. Um, or you're probably better off attending shows like this and finding something you want and buying it at whatever the current market value is for them. Um, you can't fault them for quality and engineering. Nobody ever got fired for buying a Rolex. However, it's got to be the kind of thing where what you are willing to pay is worth it to you for the piece. For me, there's a lot of other watches that are at least as well made, um, if not better, that I could get for certainly same or less money. So I, I consider that too. 
which I hope answered your question yes. in enough way to not alienate half the audience. <laughs> so, yeah. Paul whispered by a tutor for those who didn't. <laughs> Other questions? And feel free to disagree or just listen to my opinion. So. Nope. Okay, we're good. I finished on time. Yay. <laughs> Really appreciate that presentation, Jeff, and your answer to some of these crazy questions that I asked about Bolex and whatnot. <laughs> wow, we need to.